Uh, continuing on with our outstanding guest speaker series, today the TNCC Library Open Genealogy Lab is proud to present Corey Tuller and Chris Segerman. Both work at the State of Arizona Research Library. Corey is the Assistant Administrator of the State of Arizona Research Library. She previously served as Arizona Collection Librarian. She is the main liaison for the uh, library's Family Search Scanning Partnership, supports patent and trademark research, manages the library's ebook collection and vertical files, and performs outreach to state agencies, school districts, and community organizations. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in psychology from Harvard in 1992 and a master's in library and information science from the University of Arizona in 2018. She was born and raised in Massachusetts and has studied genealogical methods, researched her own Irish and Italian ancestry, and helped new researchers get excited and get started on their own research for 30 years. She hasn't yet decided which is her biggest genealogical thrill, the thrill of the search or the thrill of the find. She finds both equally compelling. Chris grew up in North Phoenix after graduating in 1999 from ASU West with a degree in English and working for the ASU West Express, he became the managing editor of the Bandera Bulletin in Bandera, Texas. He came back to Phoenix, worked for independent newspapers in Sun City and realized he was, not too, he was too introverted to be a reporter uh, as he likes answering questions rather than aggressively asking them. Uh, he has worked for the State of Arizona Research Library for more than 16 years, including the newspaper collection and the genealogy collection from 2007 to current. He has lectured on newspaper research, examined, examining and reading handwriting, as well as basic genealogy. He lives in Goodyear with his wife, Krista, two sons, Sam and Theo, along, um, excuse me, uh, though outside the house, has, has, he also has stepchildren and step-great-grandchildren. He began working in family history early with a sixth grade project going back only three generations. Years later, he found an outline descendant tree in a box of paperwork from his great grandparents and worked his way down the tree until he found his parents, then realized what the document meant. He did not realize it also meant verifying the tree's author's sources, but luckily that man, a first cousin three times removed, got his facts right. So without further ado, I'd like to offer a warm virtual welcome to both Corey and Chris. Thank you, Sue. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, welcome, everyone. And again, thank you, Sue, for the invitation to join um, the class today. Chris and I are really excited to be here with all of you. And um, as was mentioned, we work for the State of Arizona Research Library, uh, which is part of the Arizona State Library Archives and Public Records, which is a division of the Arizona Secretary of State. Um, we're excited to introduce you to our collections that can help further genealogical research. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, we're sharing information today about the research library and about the Arizona State Archives. Uh, we work closely with our archivist colleagues and they had a hand in preparing this presentation. Um, and Chris and I are going to be the, the voices for that information. Um, so um, this is home. This is our work home. Uh, we are situated in the Polly Rosenbaum building. Um, it's just outside the Capitol complex in Phoenix. And the library and archives uh, share this space. We have our collections here and our offices. We have a shared reading room on the second floor, and we work closely together to meet the needs of patrons. Oftentimes people doing research, um, whether genealogy or some other topic, um, can benefit from things that are in the library collections and in the archival collections. So we aim to uh, provide a seamless experience as we try to meet those information needs. Um, and just to note, um, as Sue mentioned, there was a handout um, that were shared with links. Um, so nobody needs to worry about uh, writing down lengthy URLs today. Um, and for those who are watching on the recording, the links um, as well as the citations for the images we'll be showing you um, will be on slides at the end of the presentation. So you'll be able to uh, pause and capture those um, as you wish. Um, so um, I'm gonna start with the research library collections. And the first question uh, is, what is the State of Arizona Research Library and what can it do for genealogy researchers? Um, it's a great question and we're excited to talk about it today. Uh, we have some amazing physical collections. Um, as you see on the left, uh, we've got the Arizona collection, 
We have newspapers, we have state and federal documents, uh, legal resources, maps, and patent and trademark resources. Um, we know that uh, people interested in Arizona resources aren't just in Arizona. Um, and so making our collections accessible and discoverable um, online is very important to us. And we put a lot of time and energy into that. Our online resources, um, most of our online resources um, are housed under what we call the Digital Arizona Library, um, which is an online collection that uh, allows us to make significant parts of our physical collections available. Um, so these colorful icons um, are tiny on the screen, but they represent um, a massive amount of content, a lot of which is of significant genealogical value. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to do a deep dive into our various collections um, to show you how and why you could be using them. Um, but first, um, let's take a little bit of a closer look at the Digital Arizona Library. Um, this slide is kind of text heavy. Uh, that's a good sign. Um, it means that we have a lot of online material um, that has genealogical value. Uh, a lot of our collections are housed on the Arizona Memory Project. Um, and you can see we've got newspapers, uh, various collections from the Arizona collection, um, brand books. And then we have a couple of databases that would be important for people to know about if they're doing Arizona research. This is kind of a broad strokes overview slide. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna do a deeper dive. Um, but first, a quick note about the Arizona Memory Project, which we call AMP. Um, we have material on there. The Arizona State Archives has material on there. Uh, but there are also over 90 partner institutions uh, throughout Arizona um, pulled from archives, museums, libraries, historical societies, other cultural institutions um, that have collections on AMP. Uh, so it's a great place. It has a lot of information and it's definitely worth your time if you're looking for information about people or places in Arizona. Um, we've worked hard to put our materials online in this way and other people's materials and we will continue to work hard. And just to give ourselves a shout out, um, Family Tree Magazine uh, recently honored us um, as one of the best state genealogy websites of 2020 for Arizona. So we are proud of that label and uh, you know, grateful for the recognition. Okay, so anytime you're working with a, a platform, um, it's important to understand its nuances um, and get a feel for how to do an effective search before you plow forward. Um, and that is true for Arizona Memory Project as well. So I want to give you a few search and view strategies um, before we talk about specific examples. Um, there are just some things that you should know about using Arizona Memory Project. I'm using screenshots today um, because it's never completely clear how stable an internet connection will be. Um, but if there's time later and if there's interest, we could try to go live on Arizona Memory Project and run some searches. Um, but screenshots for today, just for safety's sake. So this is the home page of AMP. Um, you'll see that we have some tiles that you can click on. And if you're interested in browsing in that way, that is perfectly fine. Um, but if you're going to be searching for a name or for a place or a term, um, you're going to want to do a search. And you'll see that there's a search bar in the upper right hand corner. Um, our advice is don't use it. Um, we don't recommend putting anything into that search bar. We recommend going to advanced search. Um, you've got this. You can do an advanced search. Don't let the name intimidate you. Um, uh, but in our experience, um, the best way forward is to go through the advanced search mode to really get good results. So once you click on advanced search, uh, you're gonna see a screen just like this one. Um, and there are a couple of sections here and I wanna highlight some things for you. Um, the top section 
uh, you'll see that our default is to search all the collections. Um, it's a really long list. If you click show all, uh, you'll be scrolling for quite a long time. Uh, we recommend that you keep all the collections selected um, because spreading the net wide and not ruling out any collections that might have relevant content, um, we think is important. So you'll have opportunities later if you do want to filter by collection, but we recommend uh, keeping them all. In the middle section, you can put search terms here, um, and you've got some options for customizing your search. Um, for example, you can add rows, um, and you can use Boolean operators uh, to put together something um, that really customizes what you're searching for. Uh, you'll also see that to the right, um, for each search term or search phrase that you input, you can select to search all of the words, any of the words, an exact phrase, or none of the words. Um, so we want to make sure you're aware of that capability here. Um, also, you can limit it by date if you desire. You'll also have a chance later in the process to limit by date. Um, so uh, the other thing you need to know about is pressing return after you go through the screen is not going to be enough. Um, we're going to make you work for it. You actually have to press that search button in the lower right hand corner to engage the search. So let's see what a sample results look results list, list looks like, excuse me. Um, so I input a search term, um, a name, Frances Munns. Um, if you don't know who she is, she was a famous um, Arizona uh, proponent of women's suffrage. Uh, so she seems like a, a timely person since we're celebrating the 100th anniversary um, of the 19th Amendment this year um, to use as our go-to person for a search. And I'm going to be using her later on in the presentation as well. So when you put Frances Munn's name in the search, um, here are the results that you get. Um, and you see that we have 515 records that are returned in this very simple search that I've done. Now, uh, I want to show you how to navigate the results. And then, and again, this is just to show you how to navigate the platform. We're going to be going into other results soon. But I want to point out that there's a sort by option at the very top um, that defaults to sorting by relevance. But um, if you click there, you will be able to search by title, description, date, or format, um, which will give you some flexibility on what you're seeing if you don't have time to browse the list. Um, also, if you notice on the left um, sidebar, and I apologize if my cursor has been blocking the view here. Um, let me move that out of the way. Uh, you can search by collection, or you can filter by collection, creator, uh, and so on. And since our screenshot doesn't show everything, um, I've pulled up the parts that you can't see um, where you can also search by uh, type and format. So uh, all of this filtering is based on the metadata uh, that is attached to the items. So going back um, to maybe an item we want to look at, um, I clicked on something from the results list. And this is the view that I see. And again, because we're limited to screenshots here, um, I captured the item description and I'm going to show it to you this way so you can see it. Um, uh, one of the things I want to point out to you is that the item description often includes a source identifier, which is helpful to point you to possible future research avenues. Um, for example, if you were interested in this letter, um, it's important to know where you found it online, uh, but it's also important to know where it lives physically. Um, and here you can see that it's in record group 99, um, it's in the archives, and it even gives you a box and a folder. Um, so that might be something that would be useful to take note of as you do your research. Okay, so back to the result image. 
Um, so once you click on it and you see this screen, uh, the other thing I want to point out is, um, and this might not be the greatest example because this is clearly a one page document, most of them are multi page PDFs. Um, in order to see the entire document and not just that first page, uh, you need to click the view button in the upper right hand corner to expand it. Um, the file size impacts the amount of time it takes to open. Uh, so keep that in mind. Patience might be needed depending on what you're opening. And also um, you should know that downloading from AMP is an option. So if it's a one-time thing and you just wanna look at it on AMP, that's great. If it's something that you plan to use frequently and you don't wanna take the time to go back and open it each time, uh, downloading um, could happen. And all of these items are OCR'd so that you can do a control F search um, for a key term once you've opened it or downloaded it. Um, so these are just some basic things um, that it's important for you to know about. about. Um, so let's talk about some specifics now. Um, and we're gonna start with newspapers. This is such a fabulous collection or library. Um, Many newspapers were digitized uh, because we got a grant. Um, we've gotten uh, more than one grant from the National Digital Newspaper Program. Um, and so we were able to digitize content and make it available. Our newspaper collection starts from the very early days of Territorial Arizona. Um, the Weekly Arizonian was Arizona's first newspaper. Um, and our digital content goes through the mid 20th century. Um, copyright, of course, is a factor on what can get put online. Uh, we are currently collecting newspapers, um, print copies, microfilm, even digital harvesting. Um, but whatever we can put online, we are trying to get up so that it can be accessible to people. Um, and the latest grant that we got from the National Digital Newspaper Program um, allowed us to digitize papers from underrepresented communities throughout Arizona. So we were able to get African American newspapers, Spanish language newspapers, tribal nation newspapers, um, border communities, and the like um, digitized, which has been a really valuable resource um, for tapping into the histories um, there. You'll notice here that um, you've got several search options when you're looking for newspapers in Arizona Memory Project. You can search by location, um, which includes tribal nations or the counties. Um, you can browse by special collection, which covers some of those communities that I mentioned. You can even browse by decade if you're interested to see what papers we have available um, from the 1920s, for example, um, and see what we've got published. So I wanna show you just a sample um, from a newspaper. This is the Snowflake Herald from March 9th, 1923. And just how newsy this is and how names heavy. Um, they, uh, they talked about a lot in the newspapers back in the day. Um, so you get um, the comings and goings of people. You get basketball rosters, you get uh, bank robber attempts. <laughs> and the people that thwarted them. And you also sometimes get um, summons to appear in court. So from all of these things, and this is actually all from that March 9th, 1923 paper, um, you get a lot of pointers that would lead you to other sources of information, which is really valuable. Um, and that's something that in genealogical research, you know, you want to find what you're looking for, but it's really exciting to learn about other things that would be useful to you. Um, and the newspapers is something that can help you open up your, your um, prospects. Um, so for example, with the comings and goings, if we know that Mrs. Anna Nelson came down from Sholo and was staying with family, you can tie in um, city directory research and connect some dots and maybe learn about new relationships. Um, to get the whole story of a family and their location. So um, speaking of city directories, um, who doesn't love city directories? They're such a great resource and they're such a popular resource. And um, as I mentioned earlier, we are a 
family search scanning partner. Um, and we had volunteers come and they digitized over a thousand books for us um, over the last year, the pre COVID year. Um, and we hope to get them back uh, soon once things are safer for volunteers to be on site. But um, they digitized uh, a lot of books for us and many of those were our city directories. And we have content from across Arizona um, from the 1880s to the 1960s. And they're in alphabetical order by city. Uh, and then you can click through, and I'll show you as an example. Um, once you've chosen your city, you can see all the years available. Um, and notice down here at the bottom that there are multiple pages um, that you can scroll through to get the the year of interest. Um, as you are probably aware, city directories can get quite hefty, um, which means that the file size is also pretty hefty um, and it could take several minutes to download or to open, um, but it's worth the wait. Um, and of course, like I said, downloading is an option if you're interested in that. The next collection that I wanna point out to you is our Communities of Worship. Uh, religion in Arizona collection. As we were uh, digitizing, we realized that we had um, local histories, biographies, um, directories, and more from religious communities across Arizona, um, from all different faiths, um, mostly running from 1900 to the 1980s. And we wanted to pull those together in a collection um, to show the diverse history of Arizona. Um, in terms of community worship. Um, so we've got them here and you can see on our covers that we've got the first Presbyterian church there on the left. Um, the middle one, you actually can't tell because it doesn't show up on the cover, but this is actually um, a Catholic diocese from Tucson, a directory. Um, and then on the right, we have a marriage uh, index from St. Luke's Church in Prescott, Arizona. So. Uh, great resources to look for uh, names of uh, people who might have been active in the leadership or in the communities um, of faith around Arizona. And just a special note, uh, there are several newspapers that were also published over the years from congregations and other communities. Um, and we do have some of those digitized newspaper titles um, on AMP. Um, so be sure to Look in both places if you're interested in a community of worship. Um, yearbooks, uh, we all know about yearbooks and what a, an interesting slice of life it shows us where we get to see um, what student life was like, what their worldview is like. And uh, most of our yearbooks come from the 20th century in Arizona. We have them organized by city. Um, there's sometimes more than one school in a city. Um, and we have not just public schools, but universities and other educational institutions as well. So a great resource um, to know about. Um, and I wanna point out something that um, shows how the yearbooks um, might thwart your research as well. Um, things aren't always as simple as you would want them to be. Um, so just as an example, if you had an ancestor in Bisbee in 1932, um, I pulled up that yearbook and I was looking through it. And on the right, um, you see that we've got some pictures at the top. We've got eight people um, smiling. They're all smiling. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got names, but I can't see, and maybe you do, and maybe I'm dismissing it, um, but I don't see any rhyme or reason how the names at the bottom correspond to the pictures at the top. So unless you know what your person of interest looked like, um, it might be kind of a game of guess who. Uh, so take it for what it's worth, uh, browser beware. Um, also on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the junior class role and you were looking for your ancestor, Betty Wallace, um, for some reason she did not get put down in the W's. Um, she's there in the middle of the C's. And so a quick look in the W's, you might think she's not in there. Um, but it's worth your while to do just a little bit more digging when you're dealing um, with your books because things don't always line up exactly. Um, of course, these are OCR'd and so if you're doing a control F, 
um, you know, you might be able to find the name, although OCR isn't perfect all the time either. So uh, just something to note. Okay, historical books. Um, our library is a carryover from the Territorial Library of Arizona. Um, so we've got an amazing collection of books um, that are histories, biographies, autobiographies. Um, they talk about indigenous history and culture. It, um, it's, just, it's, an, it's a really amazing collection. So uh, one of the books I wanted to bring to your attention, even if you don't have any Arizona ancestry um, or never feel like you need to look for anybody in Arizona, um, this is just a gorgeous book. Um, it talks about, the official name is History of the Arizona Territory Showing Its Resources and Advantages with Illustrations. Um, but when you look in this book, and we just recently had it digitized, um, it has sketches of notable individuals. Um, it talks about land and resources, but it also has these um, illustrations of scenery and residences, farm, and it just, it's a really like, I encourage you to um, take a look at this book if you're interested, because um, it's really um, interesting to look through. And the link will be on the end of the slides um, to show you where you can find it. Um, another series of books that I want to point out that would be helpful for genealogical research is the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Um, now we've digitized um, the proceedings of this group from 1884 to 1945, which is a great span of time. Um, and it's very names heavy. And so if you've got somebody who might have been um, a member of this organization, uh, it would be a great resource to kind of trace the, the participation um, in this way. Also, um, we know it's difficult to find the records of women and what life for women um, was like. We've digitized the Arizona Federation of Women's Clubs. Um, their yearbook, although it's not a yearbook in the other sense that we were just talking about, um, these publications contain reports from the club presidents from around the state. Um, it's also um, got some great uh, names in there that you can look for of president and secretary. So if you happen to have an ancestor um, who was part of this women's group, um, you might be able to find mention of them in here. Uh, the other thing that I think is useful about this publication is that it talks about the, um, it gives insight into what was important to women, these women um, during their time. And it talks about the social and political focus. And as you see here, um, the club in Prescott was studying about modern drama and American artists and the grand opera. Um, but they also worked with the city council in civic improvement and to create a clean city. Um, and they were engaged in philanthropy. Uh, the Somerton Club um, worked on a bazaar and a baby show and worked on social life events. So uh, just really great insight into what was going on for these women. So definitely a resource you'd want to be aware of. Um, okay, next slide is periodicals. Um, you might see these titles and wonder, what could these do for me? Um, we've got a great growing online collection of periodicals. And I think the great thing about our periodicals that might not come to mind immediately for people um, is uh, how useful they are for getting um, local history information and also in our trade journals, um, finding people's names and learning about their, their business prospects and such. So for example, um, here you see Desert Grapefruit, which was put out by the, the citrus industry. You see Arizona, the new state magazine, um, Arizona Builder and Contractor. Uh, you might wonder, what can Arizona Builder and Contractor do for me? Well, let me show you. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a little sip of water right here. Um, so many of the early issues of Builder and Contractor would include building permits. 
um, which is a great way, as you see, to get names, addresses, um, and the kinds of work that they were having done on their residences. Uh, so this is very valuable um, and very cool that this is available. Um, and people not, might not have thought that they could find this kind of information um, in a journal such as Builder and Contractor. Um, so I'm using this also as an example of how our collections can work together to create a story about an ancestor and maybe even create more questions for you to pursue. Um, so for example, I was looking here at Carl Bowers at 2243 East Willetta Street. And I thought, well, this is the August 1939 um, issue of Builder Contractor. Let me look at the 1940 Phoenix City Directory and just see how this lines up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> so here's an image of the 1940 um, City Directory. Um, and you can see uh, East Willetta and you can go down and look at 2243 and you see that uh, we don't have Carl Bowers, uh, we have a CT Powers. Um, I don't know, things got a little bit murky now. Um, there are some questions. Uh, is this the same person? Is this a typo? Is he Carl Bowers? Is he Carl Powers? Um, it raises questions and um, it kind of creates a puzzle um, that needs more attention, uh, which is okay. That's what we do as genealogists. We find information and we find more questions as we go about this. So, um, but uh, the key part is using the resources together to figure out um, what's true. So um, the next thing, moving away from AMP for just a moment, um, is I wanna point out some information about these databases um, that we have. Uh, so we have the Arizona Biographical Database. Um, it is not kept up to date, um, but a lot of work was put into it. So it shouldn't be discounted. Um, it still has a lot of value if you're searching for somebody in Arizona. Now, the way that information was input here, um, as you can see, I'm using Francis Munns as the example, um, the information was input on a kind of item by item basis. Um, and there was no controlled vocabulary for the last name and first name. So you can see that Frances Munns is showing up here um, with her name in all sorts of formats. Um, but I just typed in Munns and can scroll through the results. And that's an approach that you'll have to be aware of that the names will be inconsistent um, but it still might be your person. Um, the other great thing about this um, is for Francis Munns, if you were looking in our catalog, and we're talk we'll talk about our catalog a little bit later in the presentation, um, and you put in her name, you might not find a lot of resources if she wasn't listed as a, um, in the, one of the subject headings um, or in a name authority file in our catalog. But as you see here, um, there are a number of books in our collection um, that mention Francis Munns, and it even gives you the page number, um, and in some cases, the dates. And so uh, this is really valuable research, uh, a resource to point you to some books, references to Francis Munns in books, and uh, pointing to the legislative vertical files, just as an example. Uh, we do keep vertical files um, for notable Arizonans, as well as our legislators, um, we have a lot. It's, we've got a lot of files, uh, but it's kind of hit and miss um, on what is included in those. So uh, it's certainly something that you would want to know about, um, but it wouldn't be something that you'd want to set your hopes on too much. Um, we're working on creating an online finding aid that can go up. Um, so you know whether we even have the person's name in our files. Um, but in the meantime, you can submit a question to us and I'm happy to look it up in our um, offline finding aid um, and let you know if we have somebody on a person of interest. <clears throat> okay, Arizona legislators then and now. Um, this is kept up to date. Um, 
It has information on everybody who has served as a state legislator. Um, so here's the entry for Francis Munns, um, or at least a couple of portions of what's included for her. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here is this might be helpful to you if you've got an ancestor who served in state government here in Arizona. Um, you also might be helpful to us because this is kind of a work in progress. There's information that you might have that we don't. Um, so if you're looking through this and think, oh, I've got some information that might flesh out this entry um, in a better way, we certainly would be, um, we would welcome that input and we would evaluate it and possibly add it. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm obviously talking too much. We're getting close to Chris's turn. So um, let me do this last slide um, for me about researching brands. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, the Arizona Memory Project has brand books from 1898 to 2020 um, available online. Um, Arizona has the five C's that bolster the economy. Um, citrus, cotton, climate, um, copper, and cattle. So if you've got somebody who was a rancher that might have a brand um, attached to their, their farm, um, this would be something that you would want to know about. Um, if it was prior to 1897, it would be with the county recorder's office. Um, but we have 1898 to 2020. And um, in addition to these brand books, archives has the print records. Um, so if you were to use their resource, you would be able to see um, something like this, which even has a picture of the um, cattle in this case, and show you exactly where the placement was of the brand. So this is a great example of how library and archives will have information that would be helpful um, to further a researcher's quest. Um, Chris is going to talk about maps next, which also covers both library and archival collections, and then go into more information about other archival collections. So I will stop talking and stop coughing, and I will um, turn the time over to Chris, and I will forward slides at his command. Chris? Hey, just a second. Also, let's see, will this work? Hi, everyone. Just so you can see the man behind the curtain. I have a pinched nerve. Uh, probably, uh, it's probably still on Corey's screen. That's okay. But I have a pinched nerve in my neck, so I don't want to be like moving around too much. I can talk just fine. So we're going to be moving on to maps. And there are two branches to the collection, usually one in archives, and that would be older original maps, and then one in the state library. And that's more recent maps. We've got cities and towns, uh, county maps, maps of regions, that sort of thing. And the, the difference I sort of see is sometimes someone will just want an old map of Phoenix or an old road atlas that's on the archive or that's on the library side. If they're looking for an old original plat map, that's generally going to be on the archive side. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm following along here. So on AMP, we also have county road maps, and a lot of these were done just prior to 1983 or 1883 to 1937. They're just prior to the 1940 census. So sometimes on those old 1940 census enumeration district maps, you'll see these used, and they'll just you know write over the enumeration districts. We also have land ownership maps from 1903 to 1929, and I get a lot of questions about property research where someone says, "I want to see what this property looks like," or "I want to see what the." Deed looks like and if you go today and look at the deed it will tell you who owns, who owns it now and then you'll have to perform a very long amateur chain of title if you want to get back to something like 1903 to 1929 or you can just look at these old land ownership maps and they'll tell you with the names next slide so this is the road atlas map you've got tombstone right here and it's got the roads going through and it's also a map of uh, Cochise County. So this is just some of the things you can find that's probably gridded out by section there. 
Next slide. There we go. I think it's going down as a transition. Yeah, this is a, a land ownership map. So for some lucky reason, we have a great deal of these for Maricopa County. We don't have as many for the rest of the state, but this will show you pretty much section by section. So if you look at the top there where it says Valley Ranch Company, they own that whole section. But if you go over there to section 15, it's carved up all over the place. Valley Ranch Company has part of it. There's a little area there for Avondale. There's cold water. This is fairly close to out west where I live. And this is Township 1 North, Range 1 West. Uh, we've got these all the way from early times to later. So you can see the growth of the city. You can see who held what land. You can see like I used like when I lived in North Phoenix, there were the Deems Hills. Why were they the Deems Hills? If you check on the old land ownership now, Mr. Dean owned them. And that's the only reason. So these these a lot of these are on AMP. A lot for the on the archive side, people come and look at plat maps, which the county recorder site has, but they're not as crisply rendered. So sometimes people will look up that map on the recorder's site and they'll be able, unable to read it. So they'll come to the archives and get the whole one. And so now we're kind of moving on into our bread and butter for genealogists that are housed at the archives. Next slide. What do we do here in genealogy? We want our facts of life, our birth, our death, and our marriage, though usually I group them, group them birth, marriage, and death. Uh, one thing about the dates here you'll probably find interesting is when it says 1881 to 1948, and then death records 1881 to 71, and then the marriage records 1864 to 1950, there is a wide range of what we have of each type of record within those dates. Arizona didn't start requiring births and deaths to be registered until 1909, and that was a little bit before statehood, and Family Search says there wasn't total compliance until 1926, so if you can't find that birth or death record, that's probably why. You might be more apt to find a marriage record, but next slide will be births. So before you would come here to the library and archives and ask for a birth record, what I would usually ask you is, have you been to genealogy.az.gov? And the reason why is this is put up by the Department of Health Services and the, our Department of Vital Records is under them in that little bureaucratic moving around business. I use this site when I'm looking up Arizona births and deaths constantly. It's about the best there is for that kind of research. It's the best you're likely going to be able to get to the record quickly. It does have some limitations. There's a lot of ways to search. You'll see the fields up there like last name, first name, and then you'll see it's got facets checked off for public birth and public deaths. So you can just say, all I want to see is the births. And then if you're looking for someone and you know they were born in say 1938, but you don't quite know if the name would be spelled right, you can just set it 1938 to 1938 and then all the results in there you can sort by time so it'll just go january 1st january 2nd down the line and you can narrow it by county too uh usually where people come to us for births and death records is if they've tried to use this site and still don't get an answer and that can happen for a variety of reasons for instance if you sort it one year by date you will see a whole practically page of things maybe 20 to 30 things that aren't actually that year and that date and that's because they were mistranscribed someone did not do the transcription or ocr right and rather than leave out the results the system will put them in so sometimes that's yours is one of those mistranscribed ones, or it's possible it's missing, or before they got a chance to digitize all this, someone looked at the ledger, maybe took it out so someone could make a copy and did not put it back in correctly. But if you want to see the originals, those are at the archives. Uh, next slide. Okay, down into your birth records. So State Board of Health does, does these. Uh, our sort of birth records also can be on two places. The first place I would go to is that site just because I'm used to searching it, but you can also use Ancestry. If you don't have a subscription to Ancestry, then you know the, the other site is free. Corey found a difference here in the one on the right has everything typed in and the one on the left has everything written out, but for the same person. 
I sometimes see this from time to time in different certificates because you'll see, you know, the name and then it'll say in parentheses infant male, then document two, and sometimes document three. And they filed something as quickly as they could. And maybe there was a name change or infant male was actually Fred Smith born in Yavapai, that kind of thing. But pretty much anything up to 48, you can get uh, births are sealed 75 years, deaths are sealed 50. Uh, next slide. And so here's the death records. So this is the one from genealogy.az.gov. If you're looking over on Ancestry, you can see that, you know, you can sort from Yavapai and it's got date range 1865 to 1928 and to 38. So these would be different records. Uh, death records are kept at the state level in Arizona at this time. I think prior to 1909, you might get a couple city or county sort of registers, but it's sort of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Next slide. Marriage records we also have, and they are filed at the county level. And usually the superior court of the county where the marriage took place. And where I would say to look first is, well, we have a page of the catalogs down below, but our archives catalog is called the ASK catalog. And it's got indices up through 1972. So not only does it have uh, certificates of marriage like that one, but also consents, affidavits, and licenses. And the trouble on some of these is the certificates might not have all the information you'd want. Sometimes they're pretty sparse. But if they had to file an affidavit where they were getting married, uh, then they might need their parents' information. If they were, you know, maybe... So go down to the next slide, then we could see an affidavit and a consent. There we go. One thing I would note about searching marriage records here versus Ancestry is there are some places where it's easier on Ancestry to find them. Uh, we had a lot of people get married in Yuma in the 30s and 40s because there was no blood test. So they had a lot of records. However, they didn't store their records all that well. So I've heard horror stories and descriptions of black mold or they were kept in a garage or a basement or something. Let me just dial that sucker down. There we go. Uh, so they were kept in a garage or a basement. So usually in how these records are kept would be in a large sort of tome, uh, bigger than 11 by 17 with an index at the front. And you could check the index first and then you know, you could find your marriage that way. In Yuma, you have pages missing, you have indices mixing. So the best, I think the fastest way you can search is to go through Ancestry. But if you want, they microfilmed what they had and we've got the microfilm here, or you could go on Ancestry and look at the microfilm image by image so you can see just how scattered it is. Next slide. So in, in Arizona, well, birth and date record, birth and uh, death records are at the state level and marriages are at the county level. Divorces are also at the county level, but they are not a discrete vital record group unto themselves. Arizona treats divorce records as court records and because it's a spouse suing a spouse. Prior to when it was legal to get divorced in Arizona, you do find some divorce records in territorial legislative acts because they needed the legislator to get legislature to get in on getting a divorce. And in fact, there was a legislator who had the legislature vote on his divorce so he could get divorced. Uh, this has a register of actions for Pima County. So someplace you would look for an index first, you can look at the register of actions, but these are commonly filed in with the rest of the court records. So you'll see Smith versus Consolidated Construction Company, Davis versus Jones. And then you see something like Belt versus Belt. And I'll, I'll tell a little story about Belt v. Belt because a while ago, the archives got some kind of random bit in their archives, I think from Yavapai County Recorder's Office. And it was this odd note that was in a safety deposit box. And it begins, Mrs. Stauffer, I was in the next room, the St. Regis last evening, 6 p.m. when you called on Dr. J.G.B. I witnessed the performance, which was great. I also have witnessed many more of you two in the St. Regis and probably a hundred like it in his office. And so it's a blackmail letter. And we thought, well, who the heck are these people? 
and it was in Yavapai County, it was in Prescott. So what we did, did we do? We went to the city directories like Corey showed you and we sort of got the, you know, it had a date on it. And we found there was probably about one Dr. JGB, Dr. Bell. Stauffer was Miss Lillian Stauffer. And she, I forget, Harry Stauffer was her husband. And so the note basically said, I'm going to tell you, you know, tell your husband about all this. If you don't put this money on so-and-so's grave. So what do you do in genealogy? You've got this note, you got the people it probably could be. I went to the census and poked around and I found sure enough, there were these people living there. Dr. Belt was there in, I think it was about the 20 census or the 30. And he was there by himself. I don't know if it listed him as divorced or not. All the other particulars were there. The grave she was supposed to put her money on was her brother-in-law's, but so in going through this, the note also said, Dr. JGB also had to leave Phoenix for similar reasons. Okay, so I went to the Maricopa County court records, looked at the civil court cases around the right time, and sure enough, belt v. belt. And sure enough, he did have to leave Phoenix for similar reasons. Uh, basically, his wife filed suit because he was a philanderer. And there was a couple letters in the evidence that was also microphone from a woman who was not Lillian Stauffer. It was some other one and her photo. Now, at the time, I looked it on microfilm, and that's what I could do for Maricopa County. I eventually said, hey, could I look at the actual case and see the photo and see if there's anything on the back? And there wasn't. But when I wanted to see Mrs. Stauffer's divorce, I had to go to Yavapai County. And those divorces were not kept, or civil cases were not kept in logbooks. They were kept trifolded. So the archivist had to go and unfold them because not everything has been unfolded yet from Yavapai County, even as remote a time as the 30s. And so eventually on the final census they appeared on, uh, Mrs. Belt was still living in Phoenix with her children. Dr. Belt had moved to California and Lillian Stauffer had gotten divorced and moved to California, maybe about three miles away from Dr. Belt. I don't know if they kept company anymore. I think she eventually remarried, he did not. And that's where that story goes. But in this, we've got several different things like our divorce records in two different forms on microfilm, uh, or fold it up in paper if you want to handle the original. And you've got some of the other resources that we all like to use. So next slide. Another record group we have here are naturalization records, which are sometimes it's like looking in for a needle in a haystack because you know your ancestor will say, I want to make their declaration in one place and make the final paperwork somewhere else. But that's if you know your ancestor was here and got naturalized here, you can look for clues to that on the census. So that's another record group. Could I get the next slide then? Okay, then yeah, the next slide is wills and probate records. So for, for probate court, a lot of these have also been digitized and they're up on Ancestry. And I should mention that for a time, Ancestry made them available for free to anyone in Arizona if you signed in through our website. I believe and I've heard that after a while, because these are public records, that that restriction goes to just anyone who wants to look at them. But Ancestry had to have custody of them for a while and that sort of thing. Probate records, I found a fair amount of things. Uh, I go digging into Arizona history every so often. And if you just Google like State of Arizona Research Library, Weaver, Arizona, you'll find a couple of those blogs about this kind of violent little ghost town that sort of disappeared in the 1890s. But I found a probate record for a sister of this reputed gang. And so you, you get things like that. Uh, you can also look for wills and things. I don't think I looked for Laura Belts, but it was there. The probate records go a little bit further on than the 50s. But you get that, you can find that sort of thing in wills and probates. The next thing I'm going to probably talk about are court records in Arizona. So a lot of times when people call for any of the follow, any of the previous vital records, whether it be divorce or marriage, they will look and say, I want something that's really old. And I'm not trying to be smart about this. I'll say, how old are you talking? And they'll say, oh, 1980. And I'm sure you've all seen those things online where they'll show, hey, this TV program premiered 
20 years ago. How does that make you feel? So when someone says old in 1980, and you know, even though that's 40 years ago, to us, you know, roughly 1950 and back, 1972 and back, depending on the county, you know, we generally have things that are far older. So where people need to go for those kind of court records are the clerk of the court, the county of the event took place in. So by and large, I take, I direct people to Maricopa County Court or clerk of the court for marriages and divorces. If it's a more recent birth or death, death in 50 years, they need to go to the Department of Vital Records. And that's just the way it shakes down. We don't get custody of them yet. Uh, sometimes in some cases, we don't get custody of them all, of them at all. Uh, some time ago, I asked for the county medical examiner's report on my grandfather's death because he shot himself. And I knew that it would be a medical examiner report. I you know, contacted them and got it. Years later, when I started working here, I said, oh, do you guys have the Maricopa County medical examiner reports? And they said, well, maybe. And I said, maybe. Yes, the county medical examiner just decided we don't need all those old files and got rid of them. And the previous state archivist was a, you know, she fought all the time to get various officials to make sure our the permanent records got where they were supposed to be. But if you're looking for something more recent, you could go through the court site. Or you could just, you know, I have my quick cheat sheet for people is a list of the county clerk's offices. Uh, next slide. Because our building has the name archives and records on it, we get a lot of people who just want their records. And when they talk about their records, I sometimes get the impression that maybe they spent time in school where someone said, you'd better watch out because this is going on your permanent record. And they got the conception somewhere that the permanent record exists and everything you did would be on it. Sort of like Google these days. Uh, but so a lot of people will ask us for school records and really school records are often still at the district they're with in Arizona. There's very limited number of school records we have here. So we do have some from say St. David School, uh, Coolidge, Nogales Unified School. So we've got some of those public school records. We also get a lot of calls pretty much around transcript time when people are applying for college, people looking for charter schools. I always tell people, you know, no matter what side of, you know, how you think of charter schools, if your student or you attend one, make sure you get your records in quadruplicate because as you can see from this list here, we've got a list. The Board of Charter Schools also has a list. So sometimes people will call cold and they'll say, I need records for this school. And we could probably hear our train in our background when this building was built, they said we were on the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, but anyway, you know, they'll call for charter school records. And sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. But this is a list of the ones we currently have. And we work fairly closely, our, our staff archivist here, who works with the Board of Charter Schools to try and keep this straight. Uh, also like closed institutions like boarding schools and things like that may or may not be there because they're private institutions. And I'll probably talk about that a little bit later on. So next slide. One thing you can find in terms of school records are the school census marshal records. And census marshals would just kind of, you know, take a list of parents and children. So this is in Arizona territory from 1898. Sometimes you find stuff like that in the school census marshal records. I'll tell you, you know, their age, you know, boys, girls, totals, names of children. You get things like that. I have occasionally seen people trying to prove, you know, sometimes elderly people that yes, I did go to school here or my father went to school here when they're trying to get a copy of their birth record when birth records became harder to get. So you can use school census marshal records for something like that or just to kind of solidify that your ancestors were there. Next slide. So when it comes to property, there's a, a couple different ways of going about it. Here we have the county recorder and also the county assessor. 
And typically the way I find is the assessor is the one who's worried about money. The recorder is the one who's worried about the description of the land. So when people are looking to try and claim, say we get calls from folks who are downwinders, who uh, were downwind of the Nevada test sites, and they need to prove that their ancestors did indeed live there or own property there. If they rented, sometimes they show up in city directories. If they own property, sometimes they show up in assessment roles. And so you get different things for each county. Uh, another thing the assessment roles uh, they were used to prove was uh, some water company was, or I think the IRS was coming after someone because they hadn't paid taxes on their water rights. And it was a significant amount of money. And they said, wait a minute, I thought we always had the water rights. And so they could go into these assessment roles and find that they either had paid or there was no reason for them to pay and they were grandfathered in. But so you can find things on the assessment roles, you know, like people will occasionally say, I want to see blueprints or where's the picture of the house and there's no picture of the house, there's no print picture of the blueprint, but you can see sometimes, you know, extra structures if they expanded onto the house because the property became more valuable and they charge you more. So that's another thing if your ancestors own property here. So I think the next, yeah, the next slide is just close on up, the assessment role for Pima County. So you've got personal property, lots, that sort of thing. And you can see it's a little bit blurry on mine, the sort of things they would record. And so I think that's more the, the next slide over is, okay, we're on to great registers. All right. So I'm sure a lot of you know about like the 1890 census and how you don't get a lot of that. And your substitute for usually that is usually the 1890 great registers or you know voter registration. We've got it for more years than 1890. So sometimes when you're trying to look for someone who's maybe on the 1880 census, not on the 1900 census, and you want to see where they went off to, you can check the voter registrations to see where they, if they were still even there. The interesting thing about this, this one is it's got most folks there, except it's got about the, let's see, fifth one down, the declaration of naturalization. And so, you know, he, he was not a citizen originally, but came from Ireland and got naturalized so he could vote. This also has Francis Munns down on it. I think second up from the right-hand side. So the next time, uh, next slide. The next kind of thing you can look for then is prison records. And a lot of the ancestors, a lot of uh, folks, ancestors, you know, it kind of, can be kind of a sensitive topic. I'm the kind of guy who likes to look for family skeletons though. And so I don't mind that kind of thing. Uh, in Arizona, you get things like the register of the convict and descriptions. So this is one over here for someone at the territorial prison at Yuma. Uh, one of my Weaver stories ended in one of the brothers getting uh, sent to the territorial prison in Yuma. And he, he eventually got commuted, but there was a picture of him and it was the only picture that we had. So you also see diaries about them and guard oaths. Uh, like uh, the record group they're in is record group 031. And you get territorial prison records. You also get reports of lists of guards with their positions and their salaries. So your ancestor need not have been a criminal to be there, could have been a guard. So the next thing we have, I think it's a, another shot of the red. Yeah, this is a register of the next slide. Register and descriptive lists, lists of convicts. And you can see it's kind of like a ledger. It's got the number, the prisoner number there. So if you knew the person's prisoner number on this, you could go there and try and find the nicer photo, photograph thing you had. But you had name of convict, nativity, crime, education, county, occupation, that sort of thing. You also have remarks. So this, this sort of reminds me of reading a census, but it's not, it's a little bit more defined fields. And if you've ever seen uh, a prison listed in the federal census, that's a lot of fun too, because it will say, you know, the, the warden is the head of house and everyone else is a citizen in that house, all at the same address. 
the, also uh, here in Phoenix, our state hospital worked exactly the same way. The chief surgeon or the chief doctor at our state hospital, which in the older days, they just called insane asylum, was its own enumeration district. But so here's the, the register inside the prison then. So on to the next slide. Speaking of census records, I'm sure if you've tried to use the, you know, the federal census and you're like, where the heck, you know, was everyone in the years between the decades? We've got territorial census records here, 1864, 1866, all the way up to about 1882. And we've got an index, 1831 for Santa Cruz County only, 1862. Uh, some of these, the early ones, are going to count as New Mexico territory instead of Arizona. We've also got the federal census index in the 1870 and 1880. So on to the, the next slide, you can see it's the Maricopa County uh, census enumeration for 1882. So you've got a bunch of different folks. You, you always find interesting things about the census, like the region of Weaver I was looking at, you had a lot of people from Germany, one person from France. Uh, this person's residence was in Vulture, the top guy there, John Thomas. And Vulture was very close on the way to Weaver. It was, it was near Wickenburg. So, the next slide is another one of those places that I'm going to send you to before you would come to us. And those are county recorded offices. The best one that I've encountered so far in Arizona is the Maricopa County Recorder's Office. And that was even several Maricopa County recorders ago. We just had the election. But this is if someone, if you don't know where your person was, you know, after 1940, and they're not quite on city directories, and you're just kind of casting about, and you think they own property. This is where I send people a lot, especially if they have an obituary, and they're looking at decedents, or they're looking at the living survivors to maybe contact them. And I'll say, well, look when the person deceased, see if the kids are listed there. There's often a trust or things like that. But what I find there a lot are transfers of property. Uh, so it's basically who sold what to who, mortgages. Uh, so the documents there often, if they're not more recent ones that haven't been transferred to the state archives yet, they are scans. The originals are at the archives. What the county recorder site, at least in Maricopa offers you, is you can search by last name or you can search by business name or that kind of thing because the county recorder's books here are more or less arranged chronologically with an index in the front. But you do get things that aren't, you know, you know, sometimes I think they had whole books that are their own kind of field like chattel mortgages, or there's another book called the separate property of married women. So, you know, instead of being all lumped together, you could record your own property like clothing, and your husband couldn't get rid of it or give it away. Uh, there's been several cases where the husbands would try and get their wives committed to the state hospital so they could get control of their property. And those kind of things would go back and forth a while. But Maricopa is probably about the best one. Other county recorders, I think Pima will charge you a small subscription fee to use their services, or you can go down there, or you can come to the state archives and look at the older Pima County Recorder's Office documents. So next slide. One of the differences in our collections is the state archives collects permanent public records. And so that's territorial and statehood, but also agencies and departments. And so one of the, the little uh, decision trees you'd find is, you know, the state archives has things about the highway department, like their minutes and their rosters, payroll, whatever permanent records were there. Payroll may not be, but it was a record kept by the agency that they decided should be permanent. They've got manuscripts and they've got photographs. But on the library side of it for state agencies, anything a state agency published, like uh, highway department used to publish mortality statistics. Those aren't permanent government records. So they're not with the archives, but they are with our state documents collection. Another thing with the Department of Transportation, a lot of people think is, I would like to see my driver's license from 1976. 
there's from some fluke an early register of dri you know, driver's licenses, uh, you know, early 1900s. There is not driver's license records from 1976 because such things weren't considered permanent records then. The other thing that the archives does not have is church or religious records or private business records. Uh, occasionally a patron will say something like, well, that was an interesting business. Uh, where are their records? Because they should end up here. And they're not a government agency. We don't necessarily care. They might be in the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, there's a large collection from a cattle rancher there, for example, but because they weren't permanent government records, the archives doesn't have them. Uh, similarly, if you're looking for things like baptismal records to supplement maybe a hole in your birth certificate, where you can't find one of those birth certificates, archives isn't gonna have it. You have to go to the churches. So next slide. How do you go looking for these things? Well, ask the, you can go to the Arizona Archives online. And this, this has other tabs that you can search through. They're cataloged for a while. If you go down to the next uh, slide, you've got two big online catalogs called the Ask is for the Archives side, and the Research Library catalog is for our side. So the other thing about Archives Online from above is it's got finding aids from repositories around the state, including the archive, archives and contact information there. So for ask on the next slide down, Corey, there we go. One thing you do get on ask is along with these hot topics, there's the core collections Oh, good, it's there. And there's these, they have this drop down menu. So they've got things for, say, on the screen, Apache County State Board of Charter Schools. And that has links to more collections. And sometimes you will get finding aids about them in PDF format. Because sort of the way in back before they came up with ask is they used to have a big binder for each county or sometimes volume one, volume two for each county with all the record groups in it. And you could kind of dive around in there if you knew what you were looking for or an archivist would help you out. But they're slowly getting this thing more consolidated on ask. Meanwhile, on the library side on the next slide down. When you go to our website, azlibrary.gov, and click onto the catalog, you'll eventually come here. You'll get a little warning message that says, are you going somewhere outside this site? Do you want to do it? Do you want to do it? And this is the splash page for our catalog. Uh, you see our collections here. For So all the things Corey talked about, you also see a button there that says, ask a question. So anytime you go to azlibrary.gov at the very beginning of that page, there's a big green, big green button that says, ask a question. And that will put the question into a hopper where the librarians and archivists and me, who generally looks up obituaries and newspaper stuff, will see it and get on it. Uh, but you'll see links for the bi bi biographical database, uh, the state documents classification guide are indexed to vertical files. So if you're just kind of fishing around, you're like, I wonder if they have a vertical file, which is just sort of like a clipping file on a subject or person. You could look there. A newspaper index and all that sort of stuff is on our catalog. If you search in the search bar, if you go looking for a book, uh, I usually find the title of the book usually works fairly well. You can also go into the advanced search, but if you find your subject and you've got too much stuff in there, you can limit it by facet to a particular collection, like the Arizona collection or newspapers or state docs. So the next page is just pretty much helpful links. Yeah. The next several pages. Are, yeah. Here comes Corey. Oh, sorry, Chris, I'm going to jump in for just a second. Um, so this is recorded. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had slides for this where people could pause on um, if they needed to see it. And uh, these two pages that I just went through were the handout that was given. Um, and then these are links to um, the images that have been shared. So if you on a certain slide number and if there's a figure number attached to a, an image, you'd be able to know um, where you could go find that document, that resource that we showed you. So I'm gonna do 
just a little bit of a slow roll through these slides. And then it will get us to our final slide. Um, like Chris said, um, we've got librarians, archivists, and other staff members who are um, ready and willing to help answer questions. Um, so if you go to our website, you can click that ask a question button. Um, you also could email the address listed. Um, you could go to the web form directly if you wish. Um, and uh, I think that brings us to the end of our slides. Um, on behalf of Chris um, and for me, um, thank you so much for your time and attention. I know that uh, we've, we've put a lot of information um, in your brains. I hope that you um, uh, have questions for us. We're happy to try and come up with some answers. Um, but uh, before I pass the time back to Sue, I just want to um, put a shout out. Um, if you wouldn't mind filling out the survey, um, as soon as I stop sharing my screen, I'll upload the link to the chat um, to give us feedback on our presentation. It helps us know what we can do better. Um, and uh, we would appreciate that if you don't mind. And then I will also in the chat upload our social media channels. Um, so if you are interested in what's going on for the research library or for the archives, um, there are ways that you could follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, through our blog, and keep up to date with lots of interesting Arizona information. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing um, and turn the time back to Sue, thank you. Wonderful, thank you both. Um, I've, we do have one question so far in the chat room. Uh, they wanted to just verify that the prison records are located on azarchivesonline.org slash xtf slash search. Um, I will uh, look in our handout and confirm that for you in just a moment, let me look unless Chris, you know, off the top of your head. Uh, where I would go to them is go to azlibrary.gov, go to the archives collection or go to the genealogy facet. There should be one for genealogy and there should be one. Let me, I've got the computer up. So azlibrary.gov, uh, scroll down to branches, then archives, and there should be something uh, at the archives, there's genealogy collection. And down there uh, where it says online, ancestry.com Arizona State Archives Collection. That should have the prison registers because those were ours. Right now it does want you to enter your zip code. Otherwise the prison records are on ancestry. Or if you want, if you hit that as ask a question button and you've got some knowledge that your ancestor was imprisoned here, uh, an archivist can also look that up because we this, so we, we do have workarounds for that. Okay, and while I'm waiting for more questions to come into the chat box, um, I see that Corey, that you're posting the uh, uh, social media uh, URL. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and then I have, we do have some people in my class uh, that are brand new beginners. Uh, and some of the terms that you used, I would like, if you don't mind, uh, just to give them a little bit more explanation. Uh, for instance, you used uh, the, the term Boolean. Could you explain to the class, even though some of the class knows what that is, some of my beginnings uh, students may not. Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. Um, so the Boolean operators are and, or, and not. And so when you're combining terms, um, you can combine them in ways that affect your results. Um, so for example, if you, um, I guess I'll use a food example if people are getting hungry. Um, let's say you have, you're looking for, you want something chocolate. Um, you've got the word chocolate and you've got donut. So if you want something that's chocolate and a donut, um, then you would capture everything that had both of those qualities in it. Um, if you wanted something that was chocolate or a donut, uh, you wouldn't have anything that had both. You would have them separate. Um, if you wanted something that was chocolate but not a donut, you would get everything in that 
kind of Venn diagram of chocolate that wasn't a donut. Um, does that make sense? And did I get it messed up? I apologize if I'm confusing the terms. No, I just I just wanted the class. No, that was a good explanation. I just wanted the class to understand that how this could be effective to help them find their ancestors, not only in a database, uh, but especially when they're out on a Google search. Yes, and if you have like if you're searching for a term that um, uh, you know has other things that go along with it that you know you don't want, um, it is really helpful to narrow your results. Um, you know, we only have so much time and energy, and so you want to have a, a a focused search result um, when possible, um, so that you're not wasting your time. Wonderful. And then you also mentioned OCR. Could you explain to the class, especially for the beginners, what that means? Sure. Do you want to do that, Chris, or would you like me to? I'll go. Okay. Um. So OCR stands for optical character recognition. And that's when the scanner will scan over a typed document. And in these days, uh, I know BYU is getting into the handwritten documents, but they're the things that make your search function work. OCR is not always perfect. A uh, long time ago, I was searching a newspaper for, I think something with the, it began with a B and the news, the OCR program decided that that was not a B, it was a pipe and a three next to each other. But I will say that in looking over newspapers digitally for at least the last 10 years, it's gotten a lot better. But the OCR is the thing that allows you to look in books or newspapers and it's scanned all the words so they're searchable. The occasionally, like I know California was doing this, people can get in and edit the OCR if it's not done correctly. And I'll just put in a personal plug and say that behind every, you know, image you see of a scanned newspaper or issue, there's someone running a small program that reads the paper and OCRs it. And during our teleworking hours, that's something I do. But, you know, I don't go deep in there. I just let the computer do its thing. It's gotten a lot better over the last 10 years. I'll also point out that for the Arizona Memory Project, um, even though the documents that are OCR'd go up fully OCR'd, the Arizona Memory Project, when you're doing a search, will, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, will, OC will, will look for OCR on the first 120,000 characters possibly. Um, so if it's a really large document, um, uh, it's possible that there might be information that's relevant for you that isn't going to get picked up in a search because of that. Um, so that might impact the way that you approach your search if you know something exists, even if it's not coming through in a, um, a search of AMP, uh, maybe going directly to that document, downloading it, and then uh, doing your control F, I think would be helpful. Um, I was going to say that's where you'd want to download the whole PDF and have it look that way. Mm -hmm. And usually, you know, I'll download PDFs of things like Arizona highways or books or things like that. That's also, if you've ever looked on a book on, say, archive.org, some of those old county histories, that's why you can search them. That's also what OCR does. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, uh, we do have a question from one of the students. Uh, she says, where would be the best place to locate an obituary uh, for, uh, that appeared in Arizona in 1983? Um, I'll take it. Uh, depends on 1983. Usually what I do is I go for the city first. So if they died in Phoenix, your papers of record, at least then were the Arizona Republic and the Phoenix Gazette. If it was some small suburb of Phoenix, Glendale, Tempe, Mesa, and you know that. And usually if you're looking at something like Social Security Death Index, that'll usually give you sometimes a city. Uh, sometimes people will be like, well, they lived in Phoenix, but they died in Sun City. Sun City is a retirement community, so the papers there are interested in obituaries. That's one way to do it. If it's a smaller community like Sierra Vista or Bisbee, we've got the newspapers for them. Not all the newspapers have been digitized yet, so you can go on the Arizona Memory Project, look for things, you know, if, if it's in your date range, then you could look there yourself. If you still can't find it, if it's something more recent, like 1983, then go to our website, say, I'm looking for this obituary, and put the information in. What I usually like to see is month and year of death, uh, place of death, if possible, and I take it from there. Generally speaking, I'll search anyway if I've got a specific date from 
about two weeks, three weeks out if it's a daily, to a month, four months out if it's a weekly. And if I can't find it there, I'll let you know. And you could say, could you please search that extra week and we'll do it. But if you're looking for an obituary in 83 in Arizona, find the city first. And then I'll look from there in the big dailies. If I can't find it there, or there's no clue, it might be elsewhere, then I'll check one of the smaller weeklies. Wonderful, thank you. And then also she'd like to know, what is a downwinder? I put the link in the chat, but downwinders were people who were literally downwind of the Nevada test sites. And so the, those folks are eligible for certain recompense from the government because of that, if they had health issues. So the, let's see, you've got like New Mexico, Nevada, Hanford, Marshall Islands. And so what you've got to do then is prove that you lived in one of those locations during that time. But they were, when they were testing nuclear weapons, if you were downwind from one of those. So you are entitled to compensation. And it says, it looks like uh, that's from the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act of 1990. So that's, that's frequently when I see people who are, try, who are looking for residences in that time period, I often see people who are downwinders and that's why they're looking for that. Thank you, that's a great explanation. And then also um, the, the term odd fellows was used. Now I know a lot of people in my class does know what odd fellows, what they are, uh, what they, uh, their organization, but for those who do not, could you give a brief explanation about odd fellows? Um, I'm not sure if I'm that familiar with the organization. Are you Chris? I am not as familiar, but uh, going back to the divorce case I mentioned, both Dr. Belt and his uh, paramour were in the International Order of Odd Fellows. It's a fraternal organization like the Elks or the Masons, but it, or the, say the International Woodmen of the World. But it was a fraternal organization, and they had at least a chapter in Prescott. I'm going to put a link in the chat right now to their. Um website that would give a history of who they are as well. Wonderful. And then um, I got one more question while I'm waiting to see if anybody else in the class has any other questions. Um, you did use another term, controlled vocabulary. Now, once again, I do have some beginning students. Do you mind just kind of briefly explaining to them what that is? Sure, um, I'll give it a shot. Um, so typically when you are inputting information into a database, um, you want to make sure that you're uh, terms are going consistent and that way when you are searching for it you're going to get everything that you put in um, so typically in a library catalog um, we uh, use a controlled vocabulary for metadata or the names or the subject matters um, so that everything can get returned for this biographical database that I mentioned um, it really was a oh, we've got another item of interest for Francis Munns, let's put it in. And since there was no like drop down to restrict what you could enter, you could enter Francis Munns name in whatever they want, way they want. So it could be Mrs. Munns, it could be Francis Munns, it could be Francis Lillian Munns. And that just makes it harder to pull results out. Um, it's easier to decide how you want your name to look and then use that every single time. Um, but based on the way the database is created, um, we don't have that there, which causes a problem um, for a couple of reasons. Um, if you're not using a, a drop down in a specific spelling, um, you know, let's say somebody put it in and had a typo and put, um, you know, Francis nuns and put an N instead of an M, um, it might be kind of a needle in a haystack at that point for you to guess all of the different variations that might be seen. So controlled vocabularies are really helpful in information retrieval um, because you're making sure that you're getting everything that's relevant and you're not getting variants that people would have to guess at. Does that Yes, thank you. Another, another great example for the benefit of the class might be like if you're in a, a book catalog uh, and you're looking for a specific family name, like a surname, like Campbell <laughs> family, if you click in the, in the bibliographic record in the book catalog on the Campbell family uh, in the subject heading field, it'll take you to all the other books or uh, entries we have on that particular family. 
So that, that would be another example as well. So yes, thank you. Okay, and then the last thing, I don't see any other questions coming in for the class. So I just wanted to say, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your presentation the most was the register of convicts, um, because I, I couldn't help but notice a lot of the questions in the, in the, uh, in the log almost mirrored the questions in the census. You know, so what a, what a great resource that is. Yeah, kind of sweet. I mean, we, like, um, like Chris said, it's kind of a sensitive topic. Um, so, you know, family skeletons, uh, but, uh, you know, certainly there's some really valuable information there that's going to help you understand um, those details about your ancestor. Um, and it's, it's a, definitely a, a useful option for gathering those if it's applicable to you. The census doesn't always have what crimes they could, in fact, nearly never has what it's the crimes they committed, but that register does. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it was uh, Pedro Lucero was the guy I was, uh, I hadn't actually looked. It was one of my coworkers said, oh, he's also in the prison register and found that. So that was kind of a nice thing to find. Oh, what a, what a wonderful resource. I mean, there were so many wonderful resources in today's presentation, but that one just really caught my interest. <laughs> so, okay, well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So I'm gonna thank you both for, for your time and your expertise. And uh, I assume it'll be okay for my students to reach out to you directly if they have any further questions. Yeah, that would be um, fine. They could do, get, reach out to us directly. Uh, they could go through our website to the ask a question if they want to you know, have us do some research on their behalf. Um, you know, we certainly are happy to um, field anything um, <laughs> if they'd like to know. Wonderful. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead before I sign off and stop the recording. I just want to let the people who are still in class, uh, if you want to stay for the last hour of class, which is where we work on our trees, either individually or in groups, please do. Uh, if you are not going to stay for the last hour of class, you can go ahead and log out and I'll say thank you all for coming. And once again, to both of you, I want to say thank you for your expertise and your time today. And I will go ahead and stop the recording. Wonderful. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.